Welcome to our service this morning. And a special welcome to Pastor Rich Block, retired from Mount Calvary, and his wife Sandy, who is a lay pastor. They are, are taking care of the whole service. We are very blessed and honored to have you here today. And uh, he also will be speaking a bit about the Crossways Bible Camp in a temple talk. So that is our service. Also a reminder, today is the first rehearsal day of choir. Everybody is, is very welcome to come sing with us. Um, we hope you do. We need five at least. So here we go. thought he might take a little more time talking. So let's stand as we gather, and our opening hymn is Christ the Life of All the Living on number 339.
Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, be with you all. And, and also Lord, with you. We're going to continue with the period of time to speak. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. A reading from Samuel, the 16th chapter. Samuel had anointed David, even though he was the eighth oldest son of Jesse, and did not match his brothers in height or other physical characteristics. But with the anointing came endowment with the Spirit of the Lord, designating David as the Lord's chosen successor to Saul. And our reading. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. 
and he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now David was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is Psalm 23, and let us read responsively. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A reading from Ephesians. Because we now live in the divine light, which is Jesus Christ, we conduct our lives in ways that reflect the light of Christ so that our activity is truly pleasing to God. Ephesians chapter 8, verses 8 through 14. Once you were in darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Let us stand for the gospel acclamation. The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, did you notice that this is a rather long gospel lesson? If you're better able to listen sitting down, that's okay with me.
As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's hands, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, How then were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? And he said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been formerly blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked him, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. Then a man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins and you're trying to teach us? They drove him out. 
Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. It is good to have a companion in this ministry together. She helps me cover different things that when I miss up. That wasn't quite exactly how we had planned for the reading, but I got distracted because I was thinking, well, where is my message? Because is it back there, or is it, here's my briefcase? We do stick out for each, stick up for each other, back each other up. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask them to do something, and you need to watch and make sure they do it, okay? Okay. If you have glasses on, please take them off and set them on the pew or in your lap. or You won't need them for a moment. Now, what I would ask you to do is to take your hands and put your hand over your eyes and imagine now that you could not see, that something happened. What would it feel like to be blind? Keep, keep your hands up there. Did they, are they doing it? Yeah, okay, they're doing that. Keep your hands up there. Let's see. Do you, do you remember seeing the stained glass windows? Oh, don't, don't look. Are they looking? No? Okay. What about, it's a sunny day. Do you feel that warmth and see that sunlight shining in? Do you remember what that looked like? Are they still covering their eyes? Okay. Go ahead. Now, you can lower your hands. What is it like to see? Now, you may not know this, but I do invite conversation. So it's okay to answer that question. What is it like to see when you were imagining that you couldn't see? Dark. Dark. Let's remember that. And now when you can see, it is what? Light. Good. What else do you see? Color. Yeah. Interesting. The difference. Just 
holding the hands over our eyes. Imagine what it was like for the man in the gospel lesson. That would be pretty hard. And he was that way for a long time. And you know what else was hard? What happened next? Because people looked at him and they didn't talk to him. They talked to each other. Is this the man who was blind? Yes, I think it is. No, it just looks like him. How would you feel if people were around you talking about you, but didn't say anything to you? Sad. That's another kind of darkness, isn't it? Yeah. And then they went to the religious leaders, and the people started, the leaders started questioning him again. But they didn't believe him. He responded, look, you're asking me where Jesus is? Remember, I was blind. I needed somebody to walk with me, take me to this pool that he sent me to. I didn't see him. I didn't see where he went. But now I can see. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Let's pray. Dear God, help us to see. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming up. I believe that the focus of our lesson this morning is not so much just on a miracle, but on a relationship with Jesus and what it means to see or not to see who Jesus really is. There are lots of interesting things in this lesson. We could spend a lot of time talking about all of those different things. There is the question of whether a man who is blind had sinned. Or was it his parents? Someone he had to have sinned. And so many believe that this was punishment, that this was something that had happened, that this person had done or said, something that caused him to be blind. But this man, Jesus said, was not blind because of that. It was because of this moment that the glory of God can be shown to people that all may begin to see. Because Jesus is the light of the world. Remember when we said that it was dark and then it became light? Jesus is the light of the world. And so Jesus acts. He spit into the dust and created mud. And then with his finger, he took that mud and placed it on the eyes of this man. If you're listening, kids, I do not advise you to do that. Do not do that to your sibling. But then Jesus sent him sent him to a pool to wash. And in washing, his sight returned. Imagine this man having mud on his eyes. And he probably wasn't, maybe, wasn't able to get to that pool by himself or to get into the pool. He probably had someone who had to lead him. And I could imagine washing and opening his eyes for the first time and being able to see. And turning to that one who was there to help him said, how, who did this? How did this happen? And that person explained to him that Jesus spit into the mud and then took that mud 
rubbing it in his fingers, then rubbed it on your eyes and told you to go. And I brought you here. So imagine the man went back to where he was, that place where people knew him because he was a beggar. And he went back to that place. And they had this argument. Is he or is he not the man? I am. I am he. And then being questioned by the Jewish religious leaders. There, he was doubted. His sight came, but it, his healing had only begun. It was not yet complete. Nancy Oselman wonders about the blindness of sin. Sin, even the seemingly insignificant selfish choices we make, blocks our vision from the light. Huh. If we cannot see the light of Jesus, has our healing begun? Back to the lesson. So the man was just being talked about and was not himself being addressed in order to believe him. A writer, another writer, Debbie Thomas, proclaims, they don't know how to see him without his disability. They're still thinking that he can't see. How could he be a trustworthy witness? When we see a person with disabilities, how do we view them? Do we speak to them directly, or do we speak with the person with them? And when we do listen, do we believe their word? If we don't, is that a disability in us? Think for a moment about the growth of the man himself trusting in the light of the world. Remember that Jesus and the disciples were talking together about this man. And then immediately, Jesus acts to bring this man sight. But remember the man. What has he done or said? Nothing. There was no request to Jesus, let me see. There was no statement of belief. The only thing that he may have needed was someone to help him to get to this place where he was sent. And so after he could see, we've talked about it, that, that the people and the religious leaders questioned him and really didn't believe him. But consider how the man progresses in that journey of faith. I am the man born blind. Jesus acted, and I did what he said. I didn't see where he went because I was blind then. But I can see now. Again, to the Pharisees, it was very factual. But when they asked who he thought Jesus was, he said to them, a prophet. It continues. After talking to his parents, the Pharisees again talked to him and said that Jesus is a sinner. But notice what he says. I don't know if he was a sinner, but one thing I do know that though I was blind, now I see. Do you see the growing confession of faith in this person? It's as if he is being pushed by all the difficult, challenging questions to say what he believes about Jesus. And then Jesus finds him after he's been kicked out of the synagogue. 
and they have a conversation about the Son of Man. And this man, now looking at Jesus for the first time, he says, and who is this Son of Man? And Jesus says, it's me. It's me. And he responds, the blind, once blind man responds, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. See how that journey for that man had taken place? Was he done with his journey? No. But we look at that, and we see that this spiritual light had shined in his eyes, and it was an excitement of the joy of believing in this one. There was a wholeness of healing for the one who was born without sight. You see, that healing was physical, but it was also a spiritual in relationship with God. It wasn't done yet. There was more to come. But he was on that journey. And underlying it all, what Jesus said at the beginning of the purpose, that God was to be glorified in this man, he was glorified. And he was worshipped. The light had come. Not only physically, but relationally, with Jesus, with God. For some people, we know that they pray for healing. And I have prayed for people for healing. And yet, illness sometimes continues. So what happens? I believe in that prayer for healing. It is more than simply a physical healing. But I believe that the healing can be spiritual. It can be in relationship with God. It can be healing in relationship with people around. And sometimes that is the greater miracle. Because we do confess that with Scripture we proclaim that when Christ comes again, there will be no more, no more pain or sorrow, no more crying or tears, the wholeness and fullness of the healing of God. Laughter and joy once again. All of that is a part of the healing. I paraphrased what Jesus said to this man after that that question in this way. That Jesus says something like this. I came into this world as the light of the world so that God could be glorified. I also came that those who do not see may come to see and believe. And those who do claim to see may become blind in their darkness of sin and unbelief. Throughout this lesson, the man born blind was challenged to grow in expressing what he thought and believed about Jesus. It didn't come to him all at once. It was as if faith was growing within him as he confessed more and more that he believed in Jesus. Looking back at your life, where have you been challenged to grow in your relationship with Jesus? And now look ahead. How can you prepare for the opportunities that will come to you and they will, to confess in your words and actions what God is doing in and for you. Physical healing is only part of the wholeness of God. It may be a miracle for some. That part may not be for others at this moment. 
However, a greater healing is there, a healing in that whole relationship that is rebuilt, a relationship with God so that God can be glorified. Let's pray to a prayer that is found in a, a service of the word for healing. Merciful Lord God, constant source of all healing, we give you thanks for all your gifts of strength and life. And above all, we thank you for the gift of your Son, through whom we have health and salvation. As we wait for that day when there will be no more pain, help us by your Holy Spirit to be assured of your power in our lives and to trust in your eternal love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's join together in confessing our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Called together to follow Jesus, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Please respond with, receive our prayer. Eternal God, you seal us by the Holy Spirit and mark us with the cross of Christ forever in baptism. Inspire us by your love as together we strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Creator God, by your word you have made all things, and you hate nothing you have made. Teach us to perceive the beauty of the breadth of your creation, from the grandest mountain range to the smallest springtime bud. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God of power, you anoint kings and establish rulers and governments. Guide the work of the heads of state and elected officials, especially our mayor, our governor, our president, our legislators. Encourage them to lead with justice and to remove barriers that impede the well-being of all. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Our great shepherd, you lead us beside still waters and restore our souls. Keep watch over those who weep. Tend all who are sick. Especially today, we lift to you Pat Stricker. Comfort those who grieve, especially the family and friends of Duane Brickle. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God, our host, you fill us at your table with more than we could ever ask. Feed us with hunger for justice. Equip the feeding ministries of this congregation and our whole community. Bless the Community Partners Campus that has recently opened and the ministries that happen there. Nourish us so that we can nourish our neighbors. Merciful God, receive our prayer. God of history, with thanksgiving, we remember our ancestors in faith who cared for your people, especially Joseph, guardian of Jesus. We praise you for the ways they formed the faith of others and continue to inspire us. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Do you share a sign of peace? peace? and you may be seated. We're improvising for a moment. You didn't realize, but I'm wearing two hats today. So I'm putting on the other hat. And I am the uh, camp, one of several, many, camp ambassadors. Now I'm talking about Crossways Camping Ministry. And I do a, I'm doing a lot of different things for Crossways. You can ask my wife about that later. Um, how many places does Crossways have? Can you name the camps? Imago Dei. Waypost and Pine Lake. And there's an administrative office in Appleton. And the churches have joined together in this camping ministry and that support. And we want to thank you. Because camping makes a big difference in people's lives. It reassures young youth and adults of their whole sense of belonging to God. 
They're identified as a child of God. They are precious. And we need to remember that because so often the world does not speak that to us. I could tell you a story about how a young man, a young boy, was looked upon by a larger one and he came alongside of him. This older boy had worked with this child and encouraged him. And that, that gave both of them a sense of meaning during that week at camp. I could tell you about counselors whose lives have been changed because they realize different things at camp that have led them in a direction of pursuing a career for helping those who are autistic or a career, a, a call to serve in ministry as a pastor, just as several of the churches in our community are looking and wondering about pastoral ministry. There are a lot of changes our camps have had the last few years. Coming out of the pandemic has not been easy. We're still short of the numbers that we need. And last fall, our executive director looked and received a call to another position. And so we have an interim, an intentional interim executive director at the moment. And Scott is doing a wonderful job. We'll be looking for an executive director later this year. But right now, we're doing a strategic planning process. And we're doing that process so that we can look at who we are as a camp and how we are going to serve the churches and people in the future. It's not unlike what many churches are doing right now as well. So there's lots of things with that strategic planning process that you can be a part of. But let me first describe the different ways that we can help each other. First, if you want news about Crossways, that, and including some of these strategic planning listening sessions that will be coming up in mid-April, then let me know so we have your email address. Second, you can send youth and adults to camp. What's the youngest who has gone to camp? An infant. Who's the oldest? A couple of years ago, my father-in-law, when he was 88, went to camp. That pretty much expands, and he, you can go if you're older. You see, it's not just for youth or children, but camp is also for adults. There's family camps during the summer. There are opportunities for retreats during the other seasons of the year. Scholarships are available as well. We also need counselors. So if you know of somebody who is in college, encourage them to think about camp. Camp makes a difference in the skills of that person. They can be taught all sorts of things in education. Camp also gives an internship in learning some skills in the five C's. Communication, collaboration, critical thinking, creativity, while being in community. Those things are needed today. Fourth, you can invite other groups to go to camp. What I mean by other groups, maybe it's church groups, maybe your council, maybe others, maybe you work with several churches together to go to a camp as a retreat. Or if you know that there are groups that need to get out, maybe if you have connections with somebody with a preschool, or you have connections with somebody who's doing home schooling, encourage them to explore camp, scouts, other 4-H, other groups. Camp 
is open. Fifth, you can volunteer. And there are lots of ways of volunteering. And one of those is the work days that are coming up this spring. Sixth, you can pray for camps. We, we request your prayers. We need that for the camps, for the staff, for the board, for searching of a new director, a new site director at Waypost, all of that. We need your support and prayers. Seventh, you can contribute financially, both as a congregation and individually. And if any of you are members of Thrivent, remember your Thrivent Choice Dollars, and you can also do an action team. I just completed the, the request and received the request for an action team for an, a project that we're doing at camp. Thank you. Thank you for your support and your prayers. And if you have questions, you can, you can ask me later. There's a, a little sign out here with some brochures you can take. And then there will be some sign. There is a sign and brochures downstairs. So please come and, and talk to us about that. Switching hats. We continue with our worship service. And we join together uh, with, the, with the offering. Come to the table. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hands. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
sweet, holy, almighty, and merciful God, you are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have everlasting life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me, Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. 
God, our Redeemer, you have fed us at this table with gifts of grace, truth, and life. As you have gathered us in joy, send us forth as messengers of your peace. Make us shine with the good news of your glory, born to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is Be Thou My Vision, hymn 793. 